And today you have these novel startups, all which are really come out of a science background, who all struggle to try and build a two or three hundred million dollar facility to manufacture a product and they don't come from a manufacturing background. We we believe the technology development and manufacturing are different skill sets. We're choosing to focus on that second one. Welcome to Ag Bioscience, the number one podcast in the world for innovation in food, animal health, plant science, ag tech, and agriculture. Here is your host, Agrinova CEO, Mitch Frazier. Welcome back to Ag Bioscience. Global Market Insights predicts the precision fermentation market for food and beverage will grow from just about $2 billion in 2024 to $70 billion globally by 2034. That's a staggering combined annual growth rate of nearly 40%. One company is pioneering a new approach to precision fermentation at scale that borrows a page from the pharmaceutical industry's playbook, and their CEO joins us now. Welcome, Mark Warner, CEO and founder, co-founder of Liberation Labs. Mark, it is incredible to see you. Great. Appreciate the opportunity to be back. We have spent time together. It's been fun to watch what you're building mm -hmm. as contract precision fermentation. I think the most important place for us to start, Mark, is just to help all of us understand what is precision fermentation? Sure. At its simplest level, precision fermentation is using a microbe to make a product. Think wine and beer. Okay. For, for centuries, we've taken sugar, used yeast to make alcohol. That's a type of precision fermentation. Now, what if we do some engineering tweaks to that yeast? That's what was done in the 1980s for things like insulin, which used to be made from uh, the pancreases of pigs. Right. Um, that got to the point it wasn't it wasn't meeting the market. Genentech started at that time, came up with a microbial process to convert sugar into insulin. That has just grown into a broad range. It can be proteins. It can be a broad range of other items. One of the challenges that's happened in this market, things mm -hmm. you and I have talked about before is, as you look at a lot of these early stage companies that are focused on precision fermentation, products of precision fermentation, it's really been about scale. And you have a lot of venture that's flown into this space, mm -hmm. but venture capitalists don't want to spend money on CapEx. It's not where the return is generated. You saw this as a, as a guy who was part of a venture-backed company and mm -hmm. said, boy, I think there's something different here. Talk about this problem that you're solving with contract precision fermentation. Sure. Uh, part of the problem is that as you say, no one wants to put capital in any of these facilities. And a lot of it is because the facility we're building in Richmond today doesn't exist. We're using other old facilities. We're not using these new modern facilities. And because of that, quite frankly, the business case isn't there. Mm -hmm. So we often get this question is, is it too capital intensive? Can you ever raise the capital? As we like to say in all our discussions, there's plenty of people that want to fund facility two, three, and four once <laughs> right. it's proven. Right. The example we're given is server farms. You know, once that was proven, everyone wants to put capital into that. It's showing the business case that the products are there, they make sense, and frankly, the economics work. So we agree. It needs to transition into more of a big company, private equity type possibly public offering type play, not stay in the venture space forever, but we need to use that venture space to get us that proof of concept to move to the, the easier sources of capital. I love your analogy that you've made many times as we've talked is when you have these venture back companies who have an idea and they really seek to scale, you say, hey, bring me your recipe. Mm -hmm. And I, I can really do anything you need where precision fermentation mm -hmm. goes from this to a whole bunch. Bring me your recipe. I'll make the recipe and I'll make it at scale. You just landed. Mm -hmm. I have goosebumps, Mark. Mm -hmm. You just landed your first big customer for your precision fermentation facility in Indiana. Share more about the company. Share more about the customer. And what will you actually make for them? Sure. Um, very exciting. If for no other reason, after 300 fundraising calls, I can finally answer <laughs> yes when someone asks if we have a contract with a, a, a real client. Um, customers, Vivici, um, they make a beta lactoglobulin. For those who aren't chemists, whey protein. Um, similar, think going to Costco, you get that big whey right. protein. Uh, question we get a lot is great. We've got whey protein. Why is this better? It's better for a lot of reasons. Precision fermented proteins have a lot of functionality that the natural animal proteins don't. 
For example, you take that traditional whey protein, put it in water, doesn't mix in. Right. This protein goes right into water. Um, for things like this GOP diet world we're in, there's a lot of reasons why it makes a lot of sense. And for us, we like it because it's a case that people understand. We can also make infant formula components, biomaterials, all kinds of other things. Those aren't always as easily understood. Um, we're certainly talking to those companies too, but this kind of base case and this, the other thing we like to bring in is, is kind of a fungible nature. Let's all think back to those terrible days three or four years ago of supply chains and COVID. Think about the fact of a facility that can move from making whey protein to maybe a biomaterial within a month or two. It's, it's just a different organism. It's like loading a different software. So this contract manufacturing solution is what we believe the industry needs to really succeed. And this model is not necessarily unique. You saw similar worlds, mm -hmm. as you mentioned at the open, in pharmaceutical. Yep. where contract manufacturing is, is more the norm. Even the food industry contract manufacturing is relatively normal. But this is really the first time yeah. that we've seen precision fermentation in the space. Yeah, and as we've liked to tell people, we're really just trying to shamelessly steal the model that's been used for a couple <laughs> decades in pharmaceuticals and bring it to industrial biotech. In pharmaceutical for decades, you've had facilities purpose-built to be contract manufacturers. The example we like to use a lot is Catalan, which people here in Indiana know well. A uh, facility, I believe it's in Bloomington, makes the right. GLP-1 for both Novo Nordic and for um, Eli Lilly in the same facility. Manufacturing products for competitors is done all the time. doesn't exist in industrial biotech. And today you have these novel startups, all which are really come out of a science background, who all struggle to try and build a two or three hundred million dollar facility to manufacture a product and they don't come from a manufacturing background. We, we believe the technology development and manufacturing are different skill sets we're choosing to focus on that second one. It is a incredible future. We're going to dig into what the future of Liberation Labs looks like and how Mark and the team have navigated what has been a really challenging fundraising environment. We'll do it right after this. Ag Bioscience is supported by Indiana Farm Bureau. From berries to dairies, from crop advisors to data analyzers, Indiana Farm Bureau is at the forefront of the top issues impacting Indiana agriculture. No matter your role in the ag industry, Indiana Farm Bureau membership means you'll always have a champion and an advisor. And because so much of your time is focused on your own enterprise, it's also good to know Indiana Farm Bureau is always working to fight for the future of agriculture. We come together to advocate for rural viability, the protection of property rights, competitive tax policies, and against burdensome regulations. Whether our members need a door opened an impact in public policy, or an ally to strengthen their communities, Indiana Farm Bureau is there. We are the unified voice for all agriculture. To learn more about the benefits of Indiana Farm Bureau membership, go to infb.org. Welcome back to Ag Bioscience, talking with Mark Warner, co-founder, CEO of Liberation Labs. Mark, you've walked through what is an incredible bookmark mm -hmm. in this book that you're building, landed your first customer. But this has been a journey. Uh, you and I have had a chance to get to know each other here over the last couple of years. This has been a journey you've been on for a long mm -hmm. time. Uh, you mentioned 300 fundraising calls. My hunch is that's not an overstatement. Mm -hmm. How did you navigate it? How did you navigate going to attract capital, attracting capital to a model that has not really been uh, a part of this economy Give us a little just overview of, of how that journey has been. Sure. Uh, it's been long and frustrating at times. I'm, I'm sure that's a theme you've heard yeah. from a lot of people. We believed we were going to close the round to finish out building the Richmond facility in about three to five months. It took us 15. So, um, you know, in the end, I think it's about finding partners that are aligned with your vision. Our initial partners that we founded with were deeply invested in the synthetic biology space. And a lot of the partners we've continued to get funding from are really looking, they see the value in precision fermentation, what it brings to local supply chains, be it here or other places around the world. And they see the value in that. And they truly believe that synthetic biology is going to drive a lot of the products of 20 to 30 years from now. But yeah, 
I'd be lying if I didn't say it was a long and torturous process. It's been fun to see, you mentioned supply chains, and I think we need to spend a little time there because it's part of your decision criteria on locating here in Indiana, here in the mm -hmm. Midwest, we've talked about is access to talent, access to transportation, access to corn, mm -hmm. dextrose to feed the fermenters. Yeah. How has that decision really played for the company? You just landed your first customer, you getting product that will soon be on the streets in store shelves. How has that decision ultimately been now that you look back on it? You know, it's been great. We've, you know, I came into this having done site selection of projects around the world. Um, when we looked at 10 sites in the U.S., um, Richmond came in at the end. Um, we didn't have a site in Indiana. It came in as we were already on a short list. And we came from identifying it to having signed agreements for the facility and for incentive package in 90 days. Wow. I've spent 18 months or longer in other states. As, as we like to say proudly, what we like about Indiana is everyone here understands that yes and no are acceptable answers. Um, it hasn't so been yes to everything. It's been yes to everything we've needed. But, yeah. you know, getting a no, but getting it quickly is better than dragging on for months. And it's just, it's the right place to be. We, you know, manufacturing is a core skill set here. It's Absolutely. different than other things. And it's, you know, and, you know, the other thing was the infrastructure. You know, the facility, we haven't had to spend tens of millions of dollars to bring power and other infrastructure into our site. That happens other places. And it all comes down to certainty, things I can control. I've only really had to control the core process we're building. I haven't had to worry about, ooh, how do I build a wastewater plant or how do I bring in power? Right. So that's, it's, we've been very happy with the selection and, you know, we're looking at expanding already and that, that just gives you comfort and why we believe it was the right decision. As you think about expansion, as you think about the demand that we know exists in this space, you mean 40% kager over the next decade mm -hmm. is just unreal, unbelievable. What do you see? Where do you see the biggest opportunities, not just for Liberation Labs, but for this precision fermentation space? Mm -hmm. What are some of those things that you think could really drive growth in this market? You know, first and foremost, we do believe it's the U.S., not just because we're sitting here today, but it's one of the few areas, biomanufacturing, that the U.S. can compete. And I want to be clear on that. When you look at sugar, power, and labor, all three of those, we've looked at sites around the world. U.S. is as competitive as any area in the world. Now let's also talk about markets, especially if we're talking these novel food products. U.S. is the big market. So mm. that's clearly why we built Richmond first and we're looking to expand that said, most of these products are going to go to global CPGs that are really going to push products they can sell around the world. So we still do have a strategy to be in other parts of the world because we believe redundancy and the ability to serve multiple markets from a company perspective is what's going to bring those big CPGs in. But we still believe Indiana and Richmond will be the core of that in the U.S. When you look at this space... I, I love the stories that you share around why biomanufacturing is so important. Clearly, the work at, mm -hmm. at Liberation Labs with precision fermentation is so, so critical to, to your future, to our shared future. But biomanufacturing has a huge opportunity to drive economic growth, but also huge ag and ag bioscience mm -hmm. economic growth. Companies, farmers talk about this reality where mm -hmm. biomanufacturing has multiple ripples that come from it that really, really affect the economies in urban and rural environments here in America. Yeah. And I think it's a good story. What we like to say is think of, you know, sugar is one of our main feedstocks. As we like to say, we're a different, hopefully higher end use of that corn. You can feed the corn to a cow to make a whey protein. You can use precision fermentation. Um, doesn't mean they're really competitive to each other. In many ways, it's a hedge. And that's something I can say here that I can't say on a coastline. People understand hedging here. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. You know, people understand market shift and you want to be able to serve multiple markets. We see ourselves as kind of an upcycling of, of both the labor and the corn to to different markets. They're never, I believe, going to completely replace those markets. You know, you'll hear people that get, I used to get the question a lot, is this going to replace animal farming? We, you know, 
it's going to impact it some, but at the periphery, you know, it's growing just too fast. I think you're going to see it add a lot of those higher value products, you know, that that will really help move the economy. Well, dextrose. I mean, yeah. let's, let's be really clear. Dextrose is from corn. Yeah. When you look at the realities of the current corn market here in the U.S., mm -hmm. not the best. Cost of production in many cases is right at market price. This is diversifying demand, diversifying yep. demand for that corn, and, and you're putting that corn to a different use than would be in other places. Correct. So when you see a lot of, and last thing I want to do is profess myself to be a commodities expert, but when you look at corn a lot tied because of ethanol to the fuel industry, think of it now being balanced out against more the food and things and other areas. So that's, that's what I mean by hedging. I started yeah. my career in biofuels, and a lot of it was the desire for companies to get into alternate markets. So again, what they call upcycling, the protein side, not all the sugar going into carbohydrate uses, take it over to the, the protein markets to get a second higher value market. What's next, Mark? What, what's next for Liberation? What can we expect to see from you and your team here over the next 12 to 24 months? Boy, a lot. Um, you know, job one, get Richmond up and complete, up and operational end of this year into the first half of next year. We are currently doing a feasibility study under the U.S. Department of Defense grant to look at the expansion up to 4 million liters in Richmond. And That's we've great. also recently announced a feasibility study in the Middle East with one of our funding partners there. Again, that's part of this international network we expect to build both in the Middle East and Australia near term and beyond that. Because again, this, this is going to be important to the U.S., but it's got to be a international play. And this is always a good time to point out, we're not looking to manufacture internationally to bring back to the U.S. Every place we're looking to build facilities, like in the Middle East and Australia, it's a, always about a local supply chain security. You hope to have most of those products there locally, Sure, some redundancy and ability to have multiple sites, but it's not like a play where we're looking to do offshore manufacturing and bring it back in the U.S. No need to. We can manufacture as cost effective here. It's a powerful story. Mark Warner, co-founder, CEO of Liberation Labs. Congratulations on the first customer and congratulations on building what is and what will be the future of biomanufacturing here in the U.S. Great. Appreciate the time. And thank you for joining us on Ag Bioscience. You can always get the latest Ag Bioscience news and insights from discussions just like this by subscribing wherever you get your podcast. And don't forget... While you're online, check us out at agronovisindiana.com. On behalf of the entire Agronovis team, I'm Mitch Frazier saying thanks for joining us. We look forward to seeing you real soon. Ag Bioscience is a podcast by Agronovis Indiana, hosted by Mitch Frazier, produced by Kayla Chittister and Fabian Rodriguez, photography and design by Kaylee Kerr. If you like today's episode, subscribe, rate, and review so we can bring you more conversations just like this. Get all episodes of Ag Bioscience at agronovusindiana.com.